Hello everyone and welcome to the Road to BlizzCon Heroes of the Storm qualifiers. This is the second day of the June Open qualifiers. We had some crazy games yesterday, Anna. We had some murkies. We had a lot of murkies. <laughs> I was thinking about that. I think we probably had the highest murky ratio of any casting team yesterday. And I, I'm not mad about it. No. Proud. <laughs> proud of that. But today we've got two art gaming. We're going to be following them um, or their contenders, whoever wins here, as they'll be playing the Dragon Knights. And we'll be following that through the, through the draft pretty far in before we head down into the uh, bottom half of the bracket. But they're already drafting, so we should probably hop over and check it out. Yeah, while we're hopping over, just a reminder of what this is. This is the June North America Open for Heroes of the Storm. This is the road to BlizzCon. This is where teams fight for their chance to go to BlizzCon, compete there, and win lots and lots of money. Indeed, there's even lots of money up to grab up for grabs in this uh, just this qualifier. First place gets five thousand dollars. Everyone down to thirty second place mm -hmm. even will get some money too. So there's a lot of prize money for stake. The winners of this qualifiers, which will be decided next weekend, um, will be moving on to the America's Championship, and then we'll have seven more teams in the America's Championship, which will happen later on. I think around in September. And then from there, the winner and second place of that America's Championship will move on to BlizzCon. Yes, and there's so much more to say about that. We'll try to keep you updated throughout the day, but these teams are, these teams are ready to go. They have <laughs> already drafted quite a bit, Gilly. And we already have a Lost Vikings on the board for two arc. We've got Johanna banned out, much to my sadness, by Dragon Knights. What do you see here that you think is interesting? I am interested in the Johanna ban as well as the Uther, but I think it's really great there for, of Dragon Knights. They already have their warrior and their support, whereas Two Arc only has that specialist, that lost Vikings pick, as well as Jaina. But Two Arc doing something very similar. They went ahead and banned Kael'thas, so they picked up one of those really big bursty, um, uh, what would you call them, wizards. Mm -hmm. mages and banned the other ones. So now they're going to go ahead and grab Kerrigan and Tyrande. I have to wonder if maybe they're going to be going for the Kerrigan tank composition that we've seen them do before. <gasps> oh, I think that they, they're buttering me up, Gilly. That's what they're doing. <laughs> they're buttering me up to, to cast them with love, which I already would do for both of these teams. But man, I love Kerrigan. And if they build her as a tank, I'm going to be really interested to see what they do. Oh, the thing Dad. is... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Just the thing is that uh, I really love Kerrigan Uther together. I think that's one of the strongest things. So sad to see Uther won't be there. Yeah. But I'll be really interested to see uh, who, who will finish out that composition. But Dragon Knights is trying to butter you up, Gilly. They add Tyrael to their Brightwing. They do. They have Tyrael and Brightwing, and you know what they could do is they could they could bring tacos to the table with <laughs> the crispy taco pickup, grabbing that Falstad here. So I would really love to see that they are taking their time and deciding on their final hero. It will be a damage dealer of some sort. It has to be. Yes, definitely. If it isn't, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> I don't either. I mean, sometimes we see the double support, double, double um, warrior. But with that, you really need one of those really high damage dealing heroes like Kael'thas. And mm -hmm. Sylvanas, I don't really know that, that Sylvanas would work for that. No, I don't think so. I mean, she does her fair share of damage and she has a lot of applicability all across the battlefield. But when she has to carry a team by herself for damage, I have never seen that go very well. Ooh, a Nova. And do you think that they're doing that in response to the Lost Vikings? Or what do you think? Well, they're Jaina, Taronda, and even Kerrigan are pretty squishy there. <laughs> it is, Anna. <laughs> Your girl is going to oh. be the tank of this game. Be careful with her. <laughs> be careful. Well, I don't know, man. I, I went through a phase where I tried to build the Kerrigan tank for a long time. And it was, it was a frustrating time in my life, Gilly. And I'm, I'm a fan of the... Kerrigan, Wombo, Shielded, Maelstrom, that kind of thing now. Mm -hmm. So, Tuark, show me what I can do. Show me what I can use, please. But Dragon Knights, Nova is someone we have not seen in this tournament yet. She, this is the first time we're seeing her. So I'm really interested to see how Dragon Knights is going to make use of her. Yeah, I am as well. I think that 
They've got a lot of potential for flanking with her around a big team fight and being able to take out some of those squishy heroes. Um, looking at CC, Tuark doesn't really have a ton. I mean, they've definitely got the pulls from Kerrigan and stuns from Tyrande, but other than that, it's really just the slow that you'll get from Rhaegar's totem, as well as, you know, you've, they do have the Lost Vikings for body blocking, so they can definitely try to stand around Jaina, keep her safe, but like strong CCs that you'd get from an Uther or from like a Muradin, an actual warrior, they don't, I'm not really seeing that there. Yeah, I mean, I guess neither team has the big, big ticket CC items that we're looking for, but certainly Dragon Knights has the advantage there with their dual tank and with a lot of the really cool functionality of both Anubarak and Tyrael. So mm -hmm. two arc, especially with this tank that is built on top of a squishy assassin, <laughs> Uh, is going to have to be really careful of their positioning throughout this game. Yeah, I uh, definitely agree with that. It will come down a lot to positioning. They can, like I mentioned before, use those lost Vikings to try to throw off the positioning of the Dragon Knights. Mm. Um, but remember that with the boat now, if the boat gets taken out, all of the Vikings will come out stunned, and there's a lot of potential to quickly take them out if that were ha were to happen. Another thing to know is with Dragon Knights, they have the potential for three blood for bloods. <laughs> and two arc have no, have no tank. <laughs> so what are they going to do versus that? They don't even have that divine shield. So um, uh, maybe they've got some potential for spell shields. I'm not really sure who all could get that at 13. But we are loading into the game. So we can go ahead and introduce these teams. I opened up on red, so I'll introduce the Dragon Knights. We've okay. got... Asabin85 on a Nubarak. Purple Drank on Sylvanas. <laughs> Schuster playing Tyrael. Necro playing Nova. And playing Brightwing will be Deadly Pain. Oh, that's so appropriate for Brightwing. I agree. And for two arc, we've got Furious D on Tyrande. Chubzy on Rhaegar. Traitor on the Lost Vikings. Panucci playing Kerrigan. And Quibzy will take Jaina. Now this uh, this battlefield, just to start out the day, in case you're not familiar with it, this is Dragonshire. There are two shrines on this map, one at the top and one at the bottom, the sun and the moon. And here in the middle there is the Dragon Knight statue, the Dragon Shrine perhaps, I'm not sure. But if your team can capture both the top and the bottom shrines, it will activate that middle shrine and you can go get the dragon, the dragon suit as Gilly and I like to call it. You can put one of your heroes inside it and all of a sudden have superpowers that will really help you with pushing lanes and doing all sorts of havoc, havoc type things. And we were just talking about the Lost Vikings on two arc and something interesting for youth on this map particularly is that Lost Vikings are three bodies in one hero so you can put one of those bodies in the Dragon Knight and still have two bodies left to help team fight or escort that Dragon Knight so that can be a huge advantage when you have the Lost Vikings. Yeah that's definitely a boon that you get all of the rest of the heroes still there to be able to hang out and do damage alongside that Dragon Knight. We've got a gank squad coming out of 2R Gaming. They've already picked up a takedown on Sylvanas now it seems like they're moving back and forth between the mid and the bottom lanes. Very, very uh, normal thing that we often see with teams who are trying to run a gang squad like that or trying to be able to get a lot of damage done on the shrines. For now, we do have the dragon shrines popping up. Looks like two arc will be able to pick up the bottom one up on top. And Nubarak and Brightwing are both there. So for now, I think Trader is going to stay a little more passive with those Vikings, knowing he doesn't have to try to go in there and possibly lose them because the, his teammates are holding that bottom shrine. Absolutely. It looks like we have teams splitting the map right now in terms of shrines, but lots of aggression, which is nice to see in an early game like this. Furious D, fairly well extended, but Schuster is going to pay for it. Tyrael will fall, and Furious D and Quibzy will look to keep this shrine colored blue. Man, I thought maybe the Archangel's Wrath would take out Furious D, but he was just outside the reach of that. Very good. Up on top, however, Panucci has rotated up trying to maybe take out that Anubarak who is out of mana. So it's a little bit infuriating, but Olaf is taken out from Sylvanas and Brightwing. Remember, that each Viking only counts as 25% of a regular hero takedown. So they are a little more liberal with, with uh, losing one of those. However, Anubarak, he counts as a full, full hero's worth of experience, <laughs> and he's going to go down up on top. 
Panucci is now on the chase for deadly pain, and Trader will come body block with two of those bodies, and poor Brightwing will fall very quickly. Panucci's going to hold this top shrine, which means that the dragon shrine in the middle is activated, but only briefly, as it looks like the top shrine will uh, be taken away by Tuark. Tuark is now going to grab the bottom as well, so it will be activated again, but this time blue, and Chubsy is there to try to grab it. Purple Drank does not want to let him do it. He's going to interrupt that channel as many times as possible until reinforcements arrive. Man, Furious D has been so aggressive, almost dying so many times, but he did get the protective shield, so that's one thing. Oh no, looks like a new Brock might go down to the Vikings. One last final hit will take him down. For sure, and so now they're going to definitely be able to hold that top shrine. Bottom shrine with the takedown on Brightwing will also go to two arc. Once again, it will be up to Purple Drink to try to stop them from grabbing the Dragonite. But this time, Chubb's very aggressive up here in front. Trader is going to be able to grab it. And uh, even amidst that, they were able to take down Tyrael as well. So many early game takedowns going toward two arc. And now we see Tuark actually bringing the rest of the team to escort this early game Dragon Knight. The early game Dragon Knight's a little bit weaker than the late game, so they're looking to make sure they get the most out of this Dragon Knight. And uh, this is a really interesting style here that we're seeing from Tuark. We've got Rhaegar with the full-on um, supporting, picking up shields and heal talents, and then of course getting Farsight for the vision as well. That's going to help them with being able to see where people are and how many people are at shrines. Oh no, it looks like Tyrael will be taken out. Trader and crew have moved down to the bottom, but meanwhile up top we still have Viking soaking, so this is helping them catch back up and experience while well. everyone from Dragon Knights has to deal with this Dragon Knight, and this means that Tuark with that, all the takedowns they have so far and the fact that they're pushing this entire time in multiple lanes, they are definitely ahead in terms of experience. They're going to get those level 10 heroic abilities in just a level while their opponents have yet to pick up 7. Yeah, I mean, structures and kills or takedowns really will help you in trying to get that experience lead. And now we see Tuark is just chomping down their level 9. They will be at level 10 soon, which means they will have heroic abilities. In looking a little bit at the talent, Skilly, mentioning that we think Kerrigan will be a tank in this game, you can see that she's got her Primal Grasp range, she's got Envenom, and she's got Impaling Swarm so far. So the thing is that Kerrigan has shields that are um, in correlation with how much damage she deals. So if you really hype up the amount of damage that Kerrigan can do, you will also hype up how much tankiness she has. So we see that definitely happening so far. A really good Farsight helped see that members from Dragonites were trying to pick up the Siege Giants there around Kerrigan, but they uh, instantly were able to see that and are not going to be allowing them to do that. Now they've taken out Nova. We will have shrines here pretty soon, but this is generally the time when you'll see teams murking up. Even Tuark was able to pick up that fort with being so ahead in terms of experience. They picked up their heroic abilities. They do have the Maelstrom as well as Water Elemental Longboat Raid. Ancestral Healing and Starfall. Starfall is going to be so great for zoning uh, around those temple fights and it's also going to slow people down. I just want to talk about the synergy really briefly between the heroes on Tuark. The fact that Kerrigan's able to pull people in and then Jaina's always right there to drop her blizzard on top of them means that they're even once they're out of the stun from Panucci on Kerrigan, they're still slowed down and that Starfall is going to help with that even more. Absolutely, and we see that Tuark is roaming as a group right now. Trader with the Lost Vikings did spread out to soak up experience in the early game, but now the lead is very uh, conducive to them roaming as a squad and taking down lots of structures which will continue to add to their level lead. As you can see, we have Bruiser, Siege Giants, and the rest of Tuark down here in the bottom lane now. Well, it looks like Dragon Knights are up here trying to grab the shrine, so maybe they're hoping that a Dragon Knight could help them even the score. Dragon Knights would like a Dragon Knight, but they've got to get that level 10 first. I like that. There's a great, great zoning Starfall. If anybody wants to come in and try to contest them, they're going to have to come around the Starfall, which they've got their Vikings set up in such a way. Now, Asipin going to thorough charge in. Just a little bit, a good impale as well on Kripsy, who's getting fairly low, but a great ancestral heal already. The heal is up. There's Maelstrom pulling everybody in. And a great stun. Lunar Flare from Tirana keeps everybody there. And now only Purple Drink, the sole survivor on that Sylvanas. And two arc is going for the next keep. Possibly, well, maybe not. They're, they're a little worried. They've used all their heroics. They're going <laughs> to back off instead. The respawn timers for Dragonites are still very, very short because they haven't hit. You know, they're, they're still 
below level 10. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we do have level 13 for two arcs, so they're far beyond their heroic abilities now, continuing to build up their strength. And the thing is, they have a nice lead here. They could have continued to push by trying to take out another keep or even looking to do some damage to the core, but I think it's a smart idea when they have so much lead built up to be a little more conservative, play it safe, because they don't have to take any risks. On the flip side, their opponents really do have to take some risks, and now that they're at level 10 and they have their heroic abilities, they may be looking and hoping to grab a pick or two so that they can start to uh, get their momentum back. Well, we see that Brightwing is has uh, the Brightwing player has DC'd, but so far and chosen not to pause it. There is a precision strike, does not catch anybody really though, and now, uh, oh, a new Barak. Burrow charges in and gets stunned immediately. A really good Wailing Arrow is getting Kanuchi fairly low, but a great Ancestral Heal to bring her right back in. She's going to ravage right on top, and Brightwing, and now Brightwing and Nova will go down thanks to a really great Starfall. That Starfall mm. was epic from Shonda. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to be going after this next heave. I would not, uh, I would not be surprised if they went for core after this as well. They're so far ahead in experience. And they've got plenty of health and mana as well. They also have a Dragon Knight. Mm -hmm. It still has a little bit of green left in its health bar as well. There's only a, a Sabin 85 and Schuster here. Now Brightwing will join Brightwing Bot trying to do her darndest to help Purple Drink and Necro are here as well. It looks like they will repel to arc one more time, at least at the moment. Yeah, they are down a few heroic abilities. They've still got Maelstrom and the boat, though, so I wouldn't be surprised if now, because they picked up that Anubarak, Schuster is right there as well, will be taken out. They could have dropped those and went in for the rest of the takedowns, but they'll be content to back up Merc just a little bit and continue toward those level 16 talents. Looking at Jaina, she did pick up Icy Veins at level 13, so they uh, she's feeling very confident in the game so far. Not, not needing that sprint, instead choosing to go and pick that up to deal even more damage. In that last engagement, I think we're seeing a little bit of panic out of the Dragon Knights. We saw Schuster go in as if to lead his team into a team fight. Some of his team members were dealing with catapults and trying to clean up the rest of the base, and that left him all alone in the middle of a circle of two arcs. So I think what we need to see from Dragon Knights here is some careful coordination as they also look to grab mercenaries and do other important things on the map. Well, looking at the death counter, only one Viking has died the entire game. So whichever Viking that was really needs to get with the picture because <laughs> it's kind of a feeder. <laughs> All right, level 16 talents are up for two art gaming. It looks like for now, two blood for bloods. We also have northern exposure. So even more damage from Quibsy on Jaina. And it looks like... Uh, Yes, we are going to have the Norse Force from the Vikings as well. So, picking all those activatable abilities and Trusha Aura as well from Toronto. So, they're really focusing on damage here, just pretty much full on damage. Yeah, and we actually do have Deadly Pain back in the game to control Brightwing. So, uh, we see a rally from Dragon Knights as they try to defend this so called Death Bridge. This choke point up here on the top lane. They are managing to defend pretty well. Unfortunately for them, there are lots of other gaping holes in their defenses that they're going to have to be cognizant of, especially because they have catapults spawning in their lanes consistently. Yeah, their catapults on top, or mid and bottom. And right now, it looks like Vikings are setting up maybe to be able to take the Dragon Knight, but everyone from the Team Dragon Knights is here. They really know that a Dragon Knight would end the game, so they're going to try to deny as much as they can, but Trader was already ready, is right there to help deal with it, and now this is going to be a huge fight. A new Barak is down. Panucci right up in front, dealing so much damage with the uh, Blood for Blood and Maelstrom is right there. Purple Drink, Deadly Pain, and Necro all very, very low. Deadly Pain is going to blink heal back into the fray to try to help Purple Drink, but both of them will go down thanks for great Lunar Flare from Toronto. And that is it. Dragonite, Starfall on the core. Two Arc Gaming will pick up the first game in this best of three. Well played by Two Arc just across the board, and I love seeing a creative strategy that works well. I think, though, that we saw such an early lead that I would like to see. Mm, I would like to see Tank Kerrigan again, Two Arc. Can you just. Uh, I, I want to see it again in a new situation. I'm really into this. <laughs> really into the tank, Kerrigan. Played very well, and we, we got to see her focus on talents that really amped up her damage, as well as made her have a little more escapability, like sprint. 
And uh, that made it so that she was easily shielded and easily escapable, which are uh, two things that can help with a squishy assassin becoming a tank-like person. What about Dragon Knights, though? What do you think they could have done differently in this game to uh, avoid the early lead from Tuark? Um... Yeah, I mean, I think just playing safer, knowing that when you're playing against a Kerrigan, the early gank squad is definitely a possibility, and was so, especially with the Kerrigan Jaina, too. Um, so, not getting caught out, playing very safely and back. The problem with that is, is you still have to be able to deal with at least getting one shrine or stopping the mid from, from being taken, or else you're just giving Dragonites to your opponent. So... I mean, they had a Sylvanas, and they, we saw them a couple times try to be where their opponents were not and pushing, but the push potential by that point from their opponents was so big because they had such a level lead. So I guess just trying to know, you know, make sure they're calling out when there's rotations coming down from 2R, getting back as soon as possible, and making sure they're not getting caught out, but then maybe just constantly trying to rotate other ways by themselves. I also think that maybe a... Um, I, I don't know about the Nova pick as far mm -hmm. as damage. I think maybe a Vola, a Tychus even, someone who can do a little more consistent damage and is not, you know, relying on waiting until the opportune moment to be able to start throwing out her damage because it will give away her positioning. Um, looking at the healing numbers, I'm actually really surprised. Toronto was nearly as much healing as Rhaegar, by the way. Wow. That's really cool. And I agree with you about the Nova pick. Even if they wanted to go with a stealthy hero, perhaps even a Zeratul might have given them more advantages in yeah, this game. Yeah, he was banned. So, oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. You're right. Thank you. But Julie. I agree. But, I totally agree. Zeratul <laughs> would have been great. <laughs> but yeah, I think the Nova pick was a little suspect here. I think we'll maybe see in the next game an adjustment in the draft strategy. And I'm excited to get to it. This is a best of three, so it is 1-0-2 arc at this point. Exactly right. We'll take a quick break while we set up that lobby, guys, and when we come back, game two of this best of three. See you very soon.